Okay, you're recording, everything's all good? Yes. Okay. All right, well, might as well go ahead and get started. Um, first and foremost, thank you everybody for setting aside some time to join us for this webinar, uh, Four Ways to Increase uh, ASP.NET Performance. Uh, this has been our, our most popular webinar to date, so we try to run it a, a few times a year. Um, my name is Adam. Uh, I am a certified Scrum product owner and the uh, director of service delivery here at Alachisoft. So in layman's terms, I'm the liaison between our end customers and our internal engineering team. Uh, I also want to apologize if I sound a little funny, I am getting over a cold, so please bear with me. Um, I'll try to speak up as best as possible. Um, also with me, my associate Ron. Ron is our lead solutions architect. He has well over a, a decade of uh, building enterprise applications, and he's very pivotal, pivotal in the, uh, the strategy and roadmap of, of NCache and, and, and future releases. He works uh, very closely with our end customers, whether it's webinars like this, one-on-one uh, -on -one technical sessions, uh, demos for, for potential customers who are evaluating the product. So, so Ron's very hands-on with the customers, so uh, you're in good hands today. Um, during our presentation, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to, uh, to, to use the questions box you'll see uh, within the, uh, the GoToMeeting panel. Uh, I'll, I will personally be monitoring that pretty closely, so if I see a question, I'll make sure to, to interrupt Ron and, and get, the, uh, get all the answers. I mean, that's what you're here for, so, so don't be shy. Let us know if you have questions, and, uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Ron. Very good. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ron. Um, I'll be your presenter for today's webinar. Uh, as Adam has mentioned, the topic that we've chosen today is four ways to improve ASP.NET web application performance and scalability. Uh, it has been a very popular topic. Uh, um, we have four different features that we showcase uh, as part of this webinar. Uh, the agenda that I have uh, today uh, around this presentation that I'll talk about four different bottlenecks. Uh, four different problems in, in regards to performance and scalability that you typically face uh, in an ASP.NET web application and then we'll talk about solution uh, to those uh, four problems and, and those solutions uh, would be distributed caching features offered by NCache. NCache is our main distributed caching product uh, uh, you know it's it's for .NET applications it's written in .NET it is primarily for .NET applications but you can also use it within Java applications, but uh, primarily it's, it's a .NET based distributed caching system. So that's what I'll be covering uh, today. And as Adam mentioned, if there are any questions, please feel free to post those questions in the question and answer tab. All right, so let's quickly get started with, with some basic uh, concepts. I'm, ju I'm just going to build some details around uh, ASP.NET platform in general and then we'll talk about some some bottlenecks some problems which are associated with it uh, as you you know as you must know ASP.NET is a very popular platform it's it's already very uh, popular a lot of applications are being deployed uh, and a lot of high transactional web applications where you have a lot of users those individual users have a lot of requests load that they're putting on the application form and it scales out nicely uh, there are uh, no such scalability issues. You can put a web uh, form, right? You can create a web form, and within you know web servers, you can also have web gardens, uh, and that's something that I'll highlight once we move on to that particular scenario. But you can create a web form where you have multiple uh, web servers hosting your applications. Same application deployed on different web servers. Or it could be different applications deployed on different web servers, and you can handle tens of thousands of concurrent users as your application. Uh, know requirements scale out when when you need to handle more and more application load from the associated users uh, it it provides you the right kind of tools it gives you the ability to distribute that load uh, through a web form and, and through a load balancer so this tier of your application is already very scalable no issues within that so I'll highlight what exactly is, is a scalability pr problem and then we'll, we'll actually focus within the scalability problem four different problems uh, in regards to ASP.NET features, ASP.NET usage. And then you have a backend data source uh, storing ASP.NET sessions. You could have database which is hosting all the data that you have in your application. It could be any other application form. So as I mentioned, it's already pretty scalable. You have a typical ASP.NET web form. You can add as many servers as you need. You don't have to worry about any of any amount of you know users uh, using these web servers. So that's not the tier where you have the problem. 
the scalability problem. Let's actually uh, define what, what scalability is. Uh, scalability is an ability to increase transactional load within your application and that too without compromising on the performance side. So if your application architecture has an ability where you can handle tens of thousands of users, congruent users, and you don't slow down your application performance, uh, that is scalability. And then there's an associated term called linear scalability. What if, if that user load grows in a linear fashion? Uh, what what if it keeps growing and then there's a scenario where you now have to have hundreds of thousands of users or millions of users so that ability within an application architecture is, is called linear scalability and typically you add more servers to to attain that to achieve that and and it does not uh, you know it should not any, have an impact on the applications scalability bottleneck would be that if your application becomes slow as you add more and more caching server, you know, more and more uh, users which are connected to the application and, and you could add more and more web servers, but still it's it's slowing down. It's it's not able to cope up uh, with, with the increased amount of requests being generated by the end users. So that would be termed as a scalability bottleneck. And where where exactly do you see the scalability bottleneck? It's, it's primarily associated with, with backend data storage. And I'll highlight these one by one in, in four different ways. Uh, that these are the ways uh, you can you know you can get scalability issues and and these are the ways to get rid of those to resolve those issues so just to let you know I'll be covering all the data source related bottlenecks and and that's something that I'll, I'll cover next all right now that we've defined scalability and we've defined scalability bottleneck that you may have a situation within the application where your application under extreme loads or even in in some cases under normal loads there are some uh, performance related issues some reliability related issues but primarily uh, it's associated with backend data sources so there are four different uh, you know storage related bottlenecks which which I'll cover and, and some feature related bottlenecks so two of storage related bottlenecks I'm covering on this particular slide uh, first of all your application has to connect to a backend data source and and we've already shown this diagram right here. For example, you have a database server, or SQL server, Oracle server, any relational database. Now, you can add as many servers as you need to on your application tier. You can create a web form out of it, uh, but there isn't any uh, option of adding more and more database instances. It's good for storage. You can add, you know, scale up the database server, but end of the day, it is one big server hosting all your data and your applications are connected to it and they have to go back and forth and have these expensive database trips. Uh, so database is not meant for scaling out. It's it's there for storage and that's what it does best uh, as far as storage goes. But when it uh, needs to handle a lot of transaction load, huge amount of transaction load, extreme transaction processing, database tends to choke down. It would slow down your response because you're going through the same DBMS tunnel, right? So all your requests are queued and, you know, it would be slow in general because it's disk and under extreme load, it can choke down as well. So that is your primary issue within an ASP.NET application, which is very scalable, but on this tier, you will have one, uh, you know, one active instance of the database, which is handling all your requests. So that can slow down your performance because of huge amount of transaction load and it's it's slow in general as well because database is storing everything on the disk and disk access is, is slower in comparison. So we'll talk about a solution to this uh, in a bit. So that's you know highlighting the same scenario where we have database servers, not scalable. Although you have a very scalable web form, you can add as many resources as you need to on this tier, but this tier has a dependency uh, on, on one of the uh, you know data sources, one one of the database servers, which is all your applications are using. Second, uh, if it's a web application, uh, chances are that you uh, you must have ASP.NET session state being used in the web application. Uh, for example, if it's uh, it's an e-commerce application, it's a banking uh, application, it's an airline ticketing system. Uh, there would be uh, a mechanism behind the scenes for that particular application where you, you make use of ASP.NET sessions. It could be web forms or MVC, it's, it's common to those. So for session state, these are available uh, options. We have inproc, uh, that's one option that you can use and that essentially means that you would have everything within the application process. Right, it works, but there are limitations to it. First of all, you have to have sticky session 
on the load balancing. So your session got created on one of the web servers. Uh, all the requests for that particular user are bound to that web server. So it, there are chances that one web server has a lot of users still active, but other web servers are not active at that point. So not an efficient utilization of your resources. Since data exists in the worker process, right? So you have to have sticky session load balancing to, to, to have this particular setup. Then inproc also has issues where it cannot handle a web garden for the same reasons. Because if you try to create multiple worker processes on the same web server, although it's sticky, but it's it's sticky to the web server, but it would not go to the worker processes of the same application on the same box. So web garden is, is not an option with inproc. And then the most important bit, session is a very important kind of data. If it gets uh, a situation where a web server goes down or you have to bring it down, you lose all the data on that particular web server because it's hosting your application and at the same time it has all the data, uh, ASP data session data inside that worker process. So these are the limitations. It's It, it needs sticky session. It, it cannot uh, handle web garden scenario and at the same time uh, if your uh, you know if your uh, server goes down it, it's a single point of failure for that particular web server and then on top of it uh, the second option is state server it's slightly better than in proc and these are the options that your typical ASP.NET application offers uh, in state server you have a separate service which can be on the same box or on a separate machine uh, it's it's a service so it's storing everything in memory so it, it's not that slow it's comparable but it's still an auto process so you need serialization uh, but it cannot scale it's just a single source hosting all your ASP.NET session storage on a, on a separate server or, or typically it fits on the same box as well but it's a single point of failure if this goes down you lose everything and it does not scale out you don't have an ability to add more and more resources on this tier so that's the second session state bottleneck that you would see if you're using state server. And third option that you uh, get in a default uh, uh, ASP on a session management is, is again a database, a SQL server. Again, it's not meant for huge transactional load and session is a very transactional kind of data. Each session request is a read and write on the session object. Uh, so it's a performance issue, it's a scalability issue, and in some cases it's it's a single point of failure as well. Although databases don't go down that easily, but if they do go down and you don't have any backup, it can also give you reliability issues. So with existing ASP.NET options offered for your uh, you know web applications, you know it's in proc, I've, I've shared some details around it, what are the vulnerabilities. Then it could be state server, it's a single point of failure, it does not scale out, and then it's a SQL server which is slow to start off, it does not scale out, and it can also be a single point of failure. So that's the discussion around ASP.NET session story bottlenecks that you would see, and typically that would just uh, hamper the uh, user experience. Any user logged in, for example, it's waiting for uh, a, a transaction to be processed, for example, it wanted the user needed to buy some tickets, and, and because of these issues, it it's slow and you have a lot of user load, you know, the user experience would be hampered by, by, by these factors. And this diagram illustrates this, that although you have a pretty scalable ASP.NET web form through a load balancer, but you have various issues with in-proc, state server, and then and database uh, session management. So these two bottlenecks are, are primarily with, with the storage side of the things, where you have data storage acting as a bottleneck for your ASP.NET applications, and I'll, I'll share some uh, you know features uh, which will take care of these, which will highlight how to you know enhance performance when when it comes to this. Third bottleneck is in regards to ASP.NET view state. Uh, for ASP.NET web forms, uh, view state. For those of you who want to, uh, I'm pretty sure everybody knows what view state is, uh, but just for the sake of completeness, I'm going to go over it. View state is a client side state management. It's on the web forms, if you have a lot of controls, widgets, buttons, right, uh, text boxes, those contribute towards view state. On your request, view state gets generated, and on the response, it's, it's actually bundled along with the response packet and is, is sent back to the browser. So your end user, the browser based user, has a view state coming back to it. And that's where you know you you can see the view state. And on the next post back, when you post back, that's when you really need the view state. So for a page, a web form, a view state gets created, 
it's sent back to the browser if you plan on posting back on onto the the same page that's when you would actually bring the view state http is a stateless protocol right so it does not store uh, any user specific information it in, in turn sends it back to the browser now view state is usually heavy that's based on our experience we've seen that uh, if you have a lot of controls a lot of widgets your individual web forms would create view states and those view states would be heavy in size but think on, a, on the lines of uh, when you have a lot of users logged into it so your individual request and response packets become heavier right and then those heavy request and response packets contribute towards slow per performance so that's a factor that can slow down your performance although it's never really used on the on the browser end but it's still being part of your response and request packets so view state is, is a performance bottleneck if your view state is heavy for example if you have a hundred hundred kilobyte of view state uh, and, and that gets bundled with each request and response so you're dealing with extra hundred kilobyte object along with request and response packets and then it's also heavy on the bandwidth consumption costs uh, if you have a hundred kilobyte of view state and you have say 10,000 users hundred kilobyte and 10,000 is, is the current load uh, of, of bandwidth utilization and there's a cost associated with it so view state is a expensive packet because of its size it slows down your performance and then it also increases your bandwidth utilization costs and and that's something which can increase significantly if you have a lot of users so if you have a scalability bottleneck and you're using web forms you have view state as well so you're also getting into performance related issues because of view state and then you're also getting into consumption costs of the bandwidth that is caused by the view state so that's the third bottleneck in in our uh, particular scenario and there's a, a diagram which uh, helps to explain this it's not a data storage bottleneck it's something which is between your browser based clients and the web servers view state gets created here sent back to the browser as part of your response payload and then when you post back it comes back on the server uh, as part of your request payload so request and response packets become heavier slows down performance increases your bandwidth utilization costs and finally uh, fourth you know problem that we have with the ASP data and applications is extra page execution bottleneck obviously a, a request comes uh, to your ASP data and application and that application uh, that request would be executed uh, you may have some backend databases involved it, that goes to the backend database through your data access layer you query the database get the records and then render the response and, and a page output is generated which is preserved uh, which is actually made available to your end clients so ASP.NET page output page response is, is generated in that scenario but what if if your pages are static it's the entire page which is static or, or there are portions within the page which are static so you would be having redundant calls although the page output is not changing but you end up going back to the databases if there is a database involved you're executing the page you're handling the request uh, going to the database bringing the records back and there's a cost associated with that and then you're rendering a response which is which is being done for every single request for that particular page and although uh, your you know your page output is not changing so your page gets executed even though its output does not change that's the typical behavior of ASP.NET uh, you know web applications it can slow down your page responses when you have a lot of requests and then it can increase your infrastructure cost because you need a lot of CPU memory and database resources for same requests being executed again and again all, and although their uh, output is not changing so that completes our, our fourth bottleneck I'm just going to reiterate these uh, I'm just going to go over these one more time so first bottleneck uh, first and second these are uh, data storage bottlenecks you may have databases where you have your domain objects collections data sets uh, that you're interacting with the database through a data access layer database is slow it does not scale out so that's your primary issue then it could be ASP.NET session storage which is uh, which offers in proc state server SQL server mode and we have highlighted all the issues with, with each of these modes in proc is uh, needs sticky session it can be single point of failure it al does not allow you to have a web garden so that's a uh, problem that these are the problems with in proc state server is a single point of failure it does not scale out uh, SQL server is single point of failure it's slow and it does not scale out 
So these are problems associated with data storage and then we talked about two additional bottlenecks. ASP.NET view state which becomes heavy and goes back to the browser, comes back to the server. So it's slow and it costs uh, you know on the bandwidth consumption side of the things and then we have extra page execution bottleneck where your pages gets you know get executed although they're not changing and, and you're getting involved with back in database processing uh, page uh, request and response handling and, and, and the uh, output stream has to be generated so these are the four bottlenecks uh, and I'll, I'll I'll share some details around how to handle each of these bottlenecks with the help of distributed caching features so that's something that's coming up next yeah, and Ron, just for like to your point, for sake of completeness, uh, the the view state bottleneck you would only see within ASP.NET Web Forms. Uh, you wouldn't see view state with uh, ASP.NET MVC. Correct? That's that's absolutely correct, right? So uh, ASP.NET view state uh, is only specific to Web Forms. Uh, MVC does not make use of uh, view state anymore. So if you have an ASP.NET MVC application. Uh, that and that web application does not have any view state bottlenecks because it does not make use of view state anymore. So that's that's a that's a good point. Um, yeah. All right. Any other questions uh, before we actually move on? Um, I'm actually going to share details on these, and I'm going to build some concepts around distributed cache as a solution to this. So please let me know if there are any other questions at this point. There, there is one question, and I can actually feel this. It's a simple one. Um, we got an a asked about a, the recording of the webinar being available. Yes, uh, typically within a couple of days, uh, we'll have that up on our website. And uh, I, I see your information here. I can make sure that that you, uh, you know, get an alert when when it's available. Very good. All right. So, solution to these problems: uh, data storage bottleneck, database related, ASP Dalton session storage bottleneck, again data storage related view state and output uh, you know page output being static so view state is a bottleneck and page output being static and you're still executing those solution to these is very simple make use of a distributed caching system like ncache ncache is the main .NET based distributed caching system which will take care of all these bottlenecks and and you know mostly it would not even require any code changes so and that's what I'll, I'll cover next uh, so I'll build some concepts around distributed cache technology in general. What exactly is an in-memory distributed caching system? Uh, a typical distributed cache is a cluster of multiple inexpensive cache servers which are pooled together for memory and, and computational power. For example, if you have two servers, three servers, a distributed cache cluster can be formulated on those, those three servers and you would get storage because everything is in memory so you would get the pooling of memory resources of all servers that's a cluster and then those servers are working in combination to one another they are distributing the request load so typical uh, you know a web form related you know this allows you to have multiple sources right so you can have a distributed cache layer in between which can also scale out on the same lines so it's a multiple caching and inexpensive cache servers you don't have to have high-end machines like database server right it could be a web server kind of a box uh, a web server configuration where you could just use it uh, and, and uh, simply put it into a cache cluster. So nice thing about distributed cache, it would pool the memory resources and CPU resources and it would present you a logical capacity. It's the same source for your applications but behind the scenes there are multiple servers. Then it should synchronize cache updates across cache servers. If you update something on caching server 1 because there are multiple servers, uh, it should be visible to all the clients which are connected to it. I'm using the term visible, not not replication. Replication is another feature within the cache server where they replicate data for the backup purposes. If a server goes down, uh, you could also have the backup made available. But data consistency is a big uh, concern for most of the applications where you update something and there are multiple servers. Uh, the expectation out of the distributed caching system should be that if there is an update, it should be visible to all the clients. So it should be consistent in regards to all the caching servers that you have and your applications should see the same view of the object as soon as it gets updated. So that's uh, a very important characteristic. And then third, uh, it should scale out linearly for uh, request handling capacity, for memory capacity, and for execution power capacity. So if you have two servers, you add third and fourth server, that should simply double the capacity of how many data, how much you know data you can store, and it should also increase the capacity of request handling. 
So that's the beauty of distributed cache and that's how it actually helps resolve these bottlenecks that you typically see with, with conventional data sources. And fourth option is replication. Uh, it's very important to replicate data because data can be of, uh, you know, a very important in, in nature. Uh, so if your server goes down, it should not lose any data. High availability and data reliability feature features should be built into it. These are optional features in some cases. There are topologies which, uh, which you can use without replication, but that's entirely up to your use case. Typically, if, if data is, is uh, needed to be made available, even if a server goes down, you can uh, you know, use the topologies which offer the replication and reliability features. And this is a, a deployment uh, diagram for uh, a typical in-memory distributed caching system offered by NCache. Uh, it runs on all Windows environment 2008, 2012, 2016. Only prereq for NCache is .NET 4.0 and you could have any .NET framework applications get connected to it. In this particular webinar, we have ASP.NET applications, web forms at MVC. So they can also connect to this and they can just, uh, you know, uh, eliminate the access to the database as much as possible. You can still use the backend data sources, but for sessions, for view state and for output caching, you don't need a backend data source. You would use the distributed cache only and, and that would be better in comparison as far as performance goes, as far as scalability goes and, and data reliability goes. And, and as far as deployment is concerned, you can have dedicated caching service as shown in the diagram and your applications can connect to it in a client server model. So that's the typical deployment option that you would usually see. Quick question, Rod. Yeah. Um, so sometimes when working with uh, with customers, they see this slide and they ask, you know, because this is a semi-large environment. There's about twenty some web servers and yeah. and five caching servers in the diagram. But uh, we get a we get the question from some of the smaller environments is like, what if I only have two, maybe three web servers, and that's it. In my infrastructure, can you install NCache right on one or one or two of those uh, the actual web servers themselves? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And uh, like I mentioned, that this is uh, indeed a deployment architecture for for a typically large production environment, where we have five caching servers and a lot of you know application tiers. There's a web tier, there's a service tier, and then there's a backend server app, right? So it makes more sense to have a dedicated cache tier and then applications connect to it. For uh, a a web form having one or two or three web servers, right? And if you don't want to go with with a dedicated cache tier approach, you know, NCache works absolutely fine where you store NCache, actually install NCache on the same boxes which are also hosting your application. So that's possible. NCache does not limit. It's just that your applications and NCache would be sharing resources. So you just need to make sure that you have enough uh, resources on the application as far as hardware goes. So if you have enough memory, enough CPU, enough network interface card resources, NCache would work absolutely fine where you have NCache installed on the same boxes where your applications are also running. So two of your boxes can also act as NCache clients, your applications are running, and then they can also act as NCache caching servers where a distributed cache is running. And you know, it, it does not give you any limitations as far as functionality goes. It's it's going to offer the same functionality as well. All right, I'll quickly show you some performance benchmarks to uh, explain more on how your performance gets improved uh, and your capacity. So these are some caching topologies. So you could see uh, our partition and partition replica cache. This does not have any backup, but this also comes with backup. So as you add one to two servers, two to three servers, you can see the growth in the reads and writes per second capacity. So you keep on adding more and more caching servers and, and that's an ability that you have uh, without stopping anything. So without stopping the cache or, or any of your applications, you can add as many servers. And, and next I'll show you how to use this uh, particular cache for your applications. All right, so next we'll focus on, you know, ASP.NET optimization. So these are the four features that I plan on highlighting. But before this, I'll quickly create a distributed cache. Now that we have established that you can create a distributed cache using two or more servers and then your applications can connect to it, let me set up the environment real quick. So I have this demo one machine. Let me just log on to demo two as well. Actually, this is already. And then I'll be using these two machines for all my tests and I'll be using different applications, four different applications to be precise, to highlight data storage use case, object caching, 
session state use case, view state use case, and output caching use case. And then you'll see the difference yourself once we get started with this. So it's very simple to get started with distributed cache. There's a management tool called NCache Manager, which comes installed with it. I've already installed NCache on these two caching boxes, demo one and demo two. And I can run applications on the same machine as Adam asked. Uh, or I can use my machine to run the application. It's entirely up to you how you deploy it. So there's a set of command line tools as well. Uh, uh, you know, you can also use scripting to create the cache and then manage it at a later stage. So I'll just create a, a demo cache and this is the cache I'll be using for all the applications that I have lined up. Uh, partition replica cache is our first uh, topology and that's most recommended preferred. And by the way, all the configuration that I'm going to do this uh, within this uh, particular section, uh, these are available in our typical web, uh, you know, webinars. So I'm not going to go into deep details on what these configurations uh, mean. Uh, there is a separate webinar for this that you can uh, get a hold of. I'll just go through uh, creating a cache and then bring back the applications uh, in, into into focus. Partition replica cache, async is faster. Demo 1 and Demo 2 are the two caching boxes where NCache is installed. And I'll just provide a TCP port, provide the size, and there are recommendations on the size that it should be in accordance to the data that you plan on adding to the cache. And you should have enough memory available in the system as well. I'll turn off evictions because it's ASP and web application. I don't want to remove any data uh, if you, even if my cache becomes full. Uh, instead, I would like to provide a big enough cache size so that cache never becomes full. If it does become full, evictions can remove some data to make room for the new items. I'll auto start this cache. If a server gets rebooted, cache would automatically bring up the instance on, on the reboot. And that's it. That has created my cache. And I can now add my machine right here as a client to this. And I can start and quickly test this cache cluster. Any questions on the configurations? Uh, as I mentioned that there are separate webinars focused on this particular uh, you know, section on, on, on this particular topic where I, uh, I shared some deep details on, on different configurations that you can choose from. But please let me know if there are any questions. So everything looks good. Uh, cluster shows full connectivity as well. That's very good. I'm also going to open monitoring tool so that I can monitor this cache. There are some dashboards. So. 107 and 108 so fully connected no clients are connected let's quickly test this cache cluster by running a tool called stresses tool this is just uh, for the sake of uh, verification that my cache is accessible from my machine right here all right so expecting a client to be connected and it should show some uh, activity right here so we should have some counters which should show the activity there you go so we have requests coming to both servers backups are being formulated and that's how this topology works I think we're good uh, as far as uh, configurations are concerned and we have healthy activity from the server and from the client end so I'm going to close this down and then I'll bring the application back so I plan on covering four different, uh, you know, approaches that you can use. Uh, first of all, you can use it for data caching, right? So you can use an in-memory, fast and more scalable data source in comparison to database. Idea here is that you save your trips to the backend data source and you still use database in combination to the cache. Because we understand that your uh, database has the primary, uh, it's a primary source of your data. It's, it's good for storage and it's not practical to cache all your data when you have terabytes of data into an in-memory store. But it makes a lot of sense to cache data which you most frequently read. It could be static or transactional data, but it's data which you which you use very frequently. And although you're updating it as well. And in that case, you update in the cache as well as database or, or you just update in the cache and use some database providers on the distributed cache. So this would require you to make some code changes in, inside your application. You get connected to the cache and you know, add data to it, retrieve data from it, and then use the caching as much as possible. And then data consistency features are built into it. 
So data can can be made consistent with the database. Any changes in the cache can be propagated in the database. Any changes in the database can be propagated into the cache. So it gives you 100% synchronization support as well, based on the features which it offers. Then I will highlight session state, no code change option. So your sessions can be stored in a distributed cache faster, multiple servers, very uh, fast, very scalable, very reliable, does not require sticky session and does not require any code changes. Then we'll talk about view state and output caching. These three options are provider models. No code changes are required. And for data caching, you just need to make some code changes. So let's get started with our session state storage. I'll cover sessions, view state, and output caching first because these do not require any code changes. And then I'll cover the object caching um, as a fourth option. I have some samples uh, right here. And by the way, these samples uh, samples come installed with NCache, right? So if you go to uh, NCache install directory within NCache, uh, for example, right here, C drive, program files, NCache, samples, .NET samples, and you could see the guest game sample right here. Actually, session storage sample, I'm sorry. Session caching sample, and it's very good for ASP.NET, and inside ASP.NET there's a guest game. And this is the sample that I've opened right here. Uh, for some reason, I think, yeah. Clover has stopped working, so please bear with me, yeah. All right, so this is our uh, first web application. It's called guest game. It's one of the samples, uh, and I plan on uh, using the ASP.NET sessions uh, within this application. And I'll just quickly show you the code for this. Uh, what it's really doing is asking you to guess a random number. It actually puts that guess in a session object and then presents that session object. And then once you guess the number right, uh, it actually uh, uh, notifies you back, right? So it's a typical ASP.NET web form application. Uh, you know, that's the main web form that we're using and, and behind the scenes we're making use of sessions. Right, so uh, we'll quickly run this application since I've mentioned that there are no code changes needed. So for ASP.NET sessions, all you need to do is add an assembly tag. Allachisoft.ncache.session provider. That's an assembly which comes installed with NCache. It's available inside NCache bin folders and it's also available on the uh, Clover is back. So this assembly can be made available from right here, bin assembly, 4.0 or 2.0. So you have the session state assembly and session store provider assembly. So th these assemblies cover the session store provider for NCache. So without any code changes, you could start using the session state management within NCache. Right, so come back right here. Right, so sessions for provider assembly version is 4.6 and these are also available in Microsoft GAC folders. And then you must have a session state tag already in your application, right? All you need to do is, let me just highlight this, uh, set the timeout, which is a sliding timeout for any object which is not accessed for 20 minutes would automatically be removed. And then you plug in NCache as a custom provider and then, uh, you know, use all these features as needed, but, but the main thing that you need is specify the name of the cache. For example, we have the demo cache. And now I have on the, actually let me just close it down. This is a demo cache that we configured and I added my box right here. Now I have the client side configurations to connect to it. For example, config by doing that configuration on the manager. I now have settings to connect to the demo cache right here. So in my application, if I specify the name demo cache, it should automatically start using this particular cache for my session storage, right? So this is it, an assemblies tag and session state tag. And nice thing about NCache, let me just uh, run this application. Nice thing about session management with, with NCache is that uh, it does not require sticky session anymore. And then it does not require sticky sessions. So you can have equal load balancing on the web form. You could also have web garden scenario. And then the most important benefits, there are multiple servers hosting your application, right? So let me just go to main.aspx and guess a number, right? So it's working fine. Let me just come back 
uh, to the servers right so we have one session item and we have the backup right here and if I quickly open command tool called dump cache keys and provide demo cache it would actually dump the keys and this is a session ID and it's appended with ncache test because I, I have intentionally done that I have an ncache test attribute specified right here there you go if I just uh, provide it to be empty string it would not actually append anything so your sessions are stored in ncache uh, with the help of session IDs and uh, you know nice thing about this uh, particular feature is that they're multiple servers very scalable you can add as many servers as you need to on the fly session data is replicated so it's very reliable any server can go down you would still not lose anything you can see that uh, so once backup is being maintained here and on top of it it's it's very scalable so you can add as many servers as you need to and linear performance improvements and scalability is going to be attained in comparison to any other option that you get by by default I hope this was uh, pretty straightforward please let me know if there are any questions around this actually I have two questions um, we'll start with the first and then I'll get to the second the first is a uh, is the cache uh, name is it case sensitive um, or is, is it case sensitive even in command line tools all right so it's it's not um, you know although you could create a cache which has you know you know you can see I've, I've used capital D but in my application I simply use lowercase right so it wouldn't matter so you can have mixed case uppercase lowercase it's entirely up to you it's not case sensitive right so that that should take care of it perfect yeah okay yeah the other question it's more of a request um, one of the me audience members asked if uh, they can see in a demo one of the clusters fail um, and the session is in the others in the sessions maintained uh, so basically let's start this um, actually I stopped the application so let me just clear the contents right what I'll really do is I'll create a session object right and then stop one server and then make a few requests and then show you how this gets done this can also be done with, with the help of stressors tool uh, let's actually use that because that would be quicker uh, One session object right here its backup is right here so let's stop 107 because that's the uh, you know main server and then this should bring uh, the backup activated automatically right so let's wait for some time and this is the management which is waiting it's not and you can see the active uh, right here now coming back to the application if I guess something again right it actually started working without issues my uh, page actually refreshes it so it, it didn't actually uh, keep track of it but just to let you know that now all these requests are being handled by this right here and same session object uh, since we restarted the application is still in the cache all right so with, with the session ID right here and I can start this cache real quick this box and again now this would have the backup right here Right, so let me just refresh this and you can see the active has data and then we have the 108 again the backup so it actually distributed the data between the active and the backups and again coming back to my application let me just uh, there you go I think I'm running two instances of the same application yeah I do right so that's to demonstrate that it, it actually has the active and backups and you can stop any server at any given point this would be more dramatic if I show you with the help of stresses tool because you know that would be a lot of request load on the uh, on the caching site and that would be yeah 
now that we have a lot of items right so I can just uh, stop one node this would stop 107 108 should take all the requests and if I bring it right here you would see 254 requests now it would just double the amount of request load and this is just the manager uh, refreshing the view it's it's not something which uh, you know it can uh, in a worst case scenario, it can take up to 60 seconds to, to formulate the healthy uh, sockets. And that those are your current requests being uh, targeted to the server, which is already filled. You can see all the requests are now being handled by this server right here. Right? So that's how simple it is. And no errors being reported on the stressors too. Okay. There was a follow-up to that question. Um, more about real-life scenarios. Do the users feel the switch? Uh, between servers or is it seamless it's mostly seamless uh, because it's a it's it's only the current request which which can uh, go down while the server which was in the process of serving the request went down at that very moment right so if, if a request is already queued to a server which went down uh, you know there's a timeout of uh, 90 seconds that we have uh, for the detection and, and for making one server go down and, and making the backup available so that's the maximum uh, hit that you can see that for 90 seconds uh, and that's a, a typical HTTP response uh, timeout right so your current request may timeout but if you retry within your application it, it, it should be seamless so what you can do within the application is that you can uh, you know get, get hold of all such errors such as you know operation timed out and simply retry and, and next request would automatically be handled so you can you know improve the user experience for end user you can improve that but it's only going to be the current request which may fail and that's also a very rare scenario in most of the cases sockets give uh, you know response in, in less than a few milliseconds and in less than say 10 seconds and, and that's the time that you may see performance degradation but your request would be fulfilled I hope that answers your question uh, let me move on to the next uh, feature it's called view state cache that's also a provider uh, Without any code changes, you can start using NCache view state caching features. Uh, I have a sample right here. So that covers view state. And all you need is to set up a section called NCache NC content optimization. It registers NCache.content optimization assembly. And then this particular segment right here is, is the actual set of configurations. So you have, uh, this is an obsolete flag. So this is the flag that you need to set. You can also group view state with sessions. And idea behind NCache view state caching is that we don't send the view state back to the browser. Previously, we highlighted that your view state is always sent back to the browser, right? Uh, it's sent back to the browser, and it's not never really used there. And it can become heavy, and it can also eat your bandwidth. And there's a cost associated with it. With NCache, you can actually store view state in NCache. There is a provider which would send view state to NCache and a token is sent back to the browser. So your view state is an encoded, you know, base64 string. Uh, instead of actual sending actual view state, we store it in NCache, keep it closer to the web server, that's where it's needed, and then send a small token back to the browser. And when you post back, that token is brought back to the ser server, web server, and, and you get the actual view state from NCache. So that token is static in size. It's a small GUID. So a GUID is that what you're left with. So your request and response packets become lightweight. They improve your performance because of less data traveling between browser and, and then the web server. And your bandwidth utilization cost comes down. So it would just reduce the bandwidth utilization. And it's very simple to use. Now that I've, I've explained uh, the scenario, all you need to do is uh, set up the NCache section group and then this is the content optimization section no code changes are needed it's just the configuration and I just need to use the demo cache for this let me start stop this and let me just start this node as well so that we have the same uh, healthy cache cluster and then I'll start the application as well there are some other features you could also see how many view states per session you can dictate that you can group view states with session uh, you can enable size threshold that only cache view state which are greater than size otherwise just send it back to the browser so it can use as a mixed mode some view states are cache some are not or you can cache choose to cache everything and you can also set up a expiry time that I need this view state for only say uh, three minutes ten minutes it's entirely up to you 
so we have the cache again in healthy I'll just clear the content so that we're good to go and I'll simply start this uh, sample application and this is also something which comes in so within cache uh, it's available inside and cache samples it's right here view state so this is the sample that I'm using all right so our view state sample is there right so I can just use it and if I just show you the view state uh, paid source uh, this is your view state that's it right and if I come back right here uh, we have three view states because I, I toggled th four view states and let me just quickly show you the view states stored uh, in the key so we have the VS as, as a there's a one session and then three view states so VS these are all view states that that and cache is hosting so if I uh, simply request through these pages it'll be extremely fast and it will be storing the view state from NCache. and if I just show you the same sample without NCache, uh, now that you know the comparison I'll just keep this open but I'll just run this sample without NCache to give you a comparison on how much size uh, I'll just set up the view state to be false I hope this gets picked up on first get show you the page source this is your actual view state so in comparison it actually is going to be one good so that's what we demonstrated that with NCache you can bring your view state in NCache send view state a token back to the browser so your request and response packets become faster in execution performance is going to be improved without any code changes and your band visualization costs are also going to be improved so that's uh, section number three I'll uh, highlight two more features because we talked about four different output caching, right? So there's another sample which comes in solve within cache. So that's very simple. So it could be portions within the page which are static, or it could be entire page which is static. So all you need to do is uh, set up and cache uh, output caching, right? This is what you need. So you s definitely need an assembly uh, up up somewhere. Yeah. So just register this adapter. Uh, you don't need cache, runtime, or web. And then at the minimum, you need this uh, output caching section, right? And here you specify the name of the cache to be, say, demo cache, right? And on the page that you plan on caching, for example, this output caching.aspx, uh, you need to have the output cache directive, right? So if your product PBX product name gets changed only then the output uh, would be regenerated otherwise uh, your static page and it could be within the segment for example it doesn't have to be uh, the entire page it could be within a, a, a grid that's static right so you could just need that directive uh, on, on that particular scenario and once you run this uh, sample application it would actually automatically use NCache for caching the outputs we're using the default ASP.NET page output provider, which is in proc, but we're taking it to a distributed layer. Multiple sources are host, servers are going to host your page outputs. If your page output is not changing, you don't have to re-execute the page. So you improve performance by providing a static content, uh, static page output readily available from NCache. So that's the third feature within the line. And fourth feature is application data caching. And for that, I have another sample within the web application. You could use uh, this session store provider right here. Uh, all you need to do is, you know, it, and this sample is using session state as well as object caching. You just need to include and cache assemblies. Uh, you don't need uh, a lot of assemblies. At the minimum, you need these two right here web.runtime. And here's a page which is actually uh, making use of right here which is actually making use of uh, the caching call so you need a large sort of and cache dot web dot caching once you include the assembly you include the namespace and then you initialize the cache for example I can initialize demo cache right it's not case sensitive so I'm just going to leave it and then you can call cache dot initialize cache would initialize it uh, actually reinitializing it but this is what you need uh, only one call is good enough 
you actually use the cache handle throughout afterwards and then call cache.add this is a customer object that I'm adding into the cache object and then you can actually update it on the second button calling cache.insert just update some values uh, get the customer back cache.get and then um, you know get the count of the cache and, and, and different sort of uh, scenarios so let me just see if I can quickly run this um, I may need this to be set up properly actually uh, there's one change that I need to do the cache name has to be alright I think uh, actually you know what let me just uh, run this sample real quick So any questions so far? So this would actually uh, start using NCache for object caching and you don't have to go back to the backend data sources. And there are synchronization features such as database dependencies. Data exists in two different sources. You don't have to worry about it. Synchronization is, is built into it. Uh, I'm going to use this uh, right here because it's, uh, it's the same sample, uh, but it's using a lot more uh, you know APIs than that. Oops. I've been playing around with it so alright so this sample would actually uh, demonstrate that I have some um, let me just clear contents and same sample using uh, you know and let me just step into it and it's adding an item to the cache right and object is added to the cache it has printed this and there is, should be one item two items I think uh, there's an, a previous item as well uh, and then I'll just move on and it would just get the customer same customer would be retrieved and, and, and printed from the cache as well and then I'll update it right I think it got an error message that item object. Anyways, I, I've been playing around with this, so I may have made some uh, changes. So just uh, to let you know that this is how you would add items to it, retrieve item from it, uh, you know, go through different. And this is the same snippet uh, of the API that that we're using. So this would save your trips to the backend data sources. So your data storage related bottleneck can be resolved with the help of our data caching. Uh, feature wise you could use expirations, you can use synchronization features, SQL-like link is supported, SQL-like search and link queries are supported, uh, parallel queries can be executed, tags, groups, name tags, these are supported, data access data providers are supported, so uh, it actually gives you full support as far as uh, as far as far uh, data caching is, is concerned. So that completes our feature number four. Just to reiterate real quick, uh, we talked about data caching, uh, that was the fourth option, you can use APIs and then you can use session state without any code changes, view state, no code changes and output caching. And each would take care of all the bottlenecks that we covered at, at, the, you know, at, at the presentation startup. So I hope you liked it. Uh, I think we have three more minutes left. Uh, I'll hand it over to Adam, but please let me know if there are any more questions at this point. I hope you liked it. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll keep an eye for any questions in the last minute here. Um, other than that, we just wanted to say thank you for your time. Um, we hope you, you took away something from the presentation. Uh, if you want to uh, evaluate NCache hands-on, uh, you can download our enterprise version right off our website. Uh, during the evaluation, don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, as much as necessary. Use our support team. Um, if you're interested, we could also set up a one-on-one um, -on -one technical session to, to dive deeper into your particular use case or just a one-on-one -on -one demo to, to go further into uh, some of the features of, of NCache itself. So, so yeah, we're, we're here. If, uh, and then we've got a question. Oh, just a, a thank you. Everybody, you're welcome. Uh, and again, we thank you for, uh, for taking some of your day and and spending some time with us. And if you have any other questions, reach out to us, don't hesitate. But, uh, but thank you for your time and have a run wonderful week. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.